my name is Josh Green. I'm your host today on Healthcare in Hawaii, a new show brought to you by Think Tech Hawaii and myself. I'm really pleased to be with you to talk about healthcare, really every aspect of our healthcare system here in our state. Last week we had a very interesting guest, that was Beth Geesting. She was the uh, basically the lead person, is the lead person from the Abercrombie administration on healthcare transformation. I like to call her the healthcare czar, kind of hearkening back to my own Russian uh, upbringing, the Russian mother. And she really gave us a good overview perspective on what the state is doing, what healthcare looks, uh, looks like in the context of the national movement on healthcare transformation, and what's possible in our state. We talked about many different issues, one of which was the patient-centered medical home, which I hope to bring up again today. Healthcare transformation is a gigantic uh, term. I think maybe it's overused sometimes, which is why I want to bring in a lot of experts from across many disciplines in our healthcare system. And today, that brings us to uh, one, of, uh, one of the people I consider a dear friend and really one of our healthcare experts here in the state of Hawaii, Hilton Rathel. Hilton's the Executive Vice President at HMSA. He's also their Chief Health Officer, and we're going to let Hilton tell us a little bit about uh, what those titles mean. They really do mean quite a lot at that organization. But first, let me introduce you to Hilton, and he'll first also give us a few words about himself. Thank you, Josh, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. I really appreciate it, and I'm pleased to be able to talk about what HMSA is doing in the market to deal with the healthcare revolution. Yes. Um, I've, um, been with HMSA for just a little under four years. Um, prior to that, I spent over 20 years working on the provider side. I worked with Hawaii Pacific Health almost for almost 10 years. And prior to that, I was in Southern California working for a multi-hospital integrated system in Southern California for about 12 years. So I have about over 22 years of experience on the provider side, and now I'm really excited to be working with HMSA and working on this revolution in healthcare. So I think, uh, Hilton, what you're telling us is you bring several perspectives to, uh, to the healthcare revolution as we're describing it in today's show. And, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to have you here as um, one of our first guests, because in my experiences with you, you do have that perspective of what the providers see in the healthcare system, what the hospitals see, and now what HMSA um, brings to the table. I, I thought maybe a good way to start today, now knowing your background, would be to have you tell us a little bit about HMSA, a little bit about what its um, influence is in the state, how many people are insured, and so on, just so people can have a perspective as we lay out what HMSA is doing and participating in in healthcare transformation. Well, this year happens to be our 75th anniversary here in Hawaii. So we're a local, nonprofit, mutual benefit society. And we're very, very fortunate to represent over 720,000 people in the state of Hawaii. Now, we provide services or provide insurance for people on the commercial business. We have PPO and HMO products. We also have a um, large population of Quest uh, members as well. Mm -hmm. And we also have senior members, so a total of 720,000. So yeah, I've, I, last week when we were talking with Beth, we were talking about kind of how many people were uninsured in the state, and we expressed that it's about 10% of the population. So you take those 10% of, I don't know, about 1.4 million people, and then you take aside the military, so that leaves quite a lot of uh, insured individuals with HMSA. What, what percentage is it, just so I can share that with the viewers? We have uh, just under 60% of the market here in Hawaii. Um, Kaiser is a large plan that's here as well, and there are some small local plans. There are um, fee-for-service Medicare or seniors as well. Um, so we have just under about 60% of the insured market here in Hawaii. That's a, um, so that's a big number. You know, at different times in, in the state's history, people have said, HMSA, I love them as my insurer. Are they too big? I mean, what does that mean? Is it, 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 I've never had any problems, per se, about my insurance, which has been HMSA. I, I've never had um, Kaiser. My wife did one time in her life. But do you have a large market share so that you're like the big game in town, the only game in town? Or are you really, um, is that just a reality of being in the islands? Is that similar in other states? Um, it does vary fairly dramatically from state to state. It's fairly atypical for an insurer to have a, as significant a market share as we have, but however, there are other states in the country where um, a single plan will have even a higher penetration than what we do. Um, now, there, are, there is a lot of different opinions, obviously, as to whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, we obviously think it's a good thing, um, and, and we can get into some of those details later, but. We didn't start off as a dominant insurance plan. We started off 75 years ago. It was a very small plan, and we have grown over the time. 
over time and we've grown because people obviously um, employers and individuals see the value that HMSA brings yeah. um, we don't coerce people into signing up we offer insurance out there and it's a competitive market there are competitors in the market that we're competing with right. on a daily basis and we and we, we feel very fortunate that um, again that many people have uh, chosen HMSA as their insurer. Sure. Well, I, I think that also we see different trends in Hawaii that are similar. We see that there are two big hospital systems, frankly, it's Queens and Hawaii Pacific Health. And it, you know, it often works to the benefit of the providers and the, you know, the physicians and the nurse practitioners because they know which facilities they're going to practice at. So I think it's very helpful. Um, it does make you a leader, though, in the state. It, there's no question about that. And I think that's really one of the reasons I wanted to have you here today before most people because you've led on healthcare um, reform and transformation more than most. Maybe you could tell us a little bit in your last four years, you know, in your time as, as kind of a senior individual at HMSA, what that's meant. What does leading uh, the healthcare change in our system mean from the perspective of HMSA? Well, Josh, there's a lot of things that we're doing here in Hawaii. Um, and you're right, um, being as big as we are does mean that we have a huge amount of responsibility. Now, we take that responsibility very, very seriously. As I mentioned before, we're a not-for-profit. Right. So we are here for one reason, and that is to serve the community and to improve the health and well-being of the people of Hawaii. We take that position very, very uh, seriously. And it's one of the reasons that I, I chose to work at HMSA and I enjoy working with the, te the, the team that we have. Mm -hmm. When you've got um, a significant share of the market, and as I mentioned previously, I worked in Southern California. Now, Southern California is a huge market. It's many times the size of Hawaii just in Southern California. Right. But it's all, all also a very fragmented market. You've got lots of different employers, lots of different hospital systems, lots of different physician groups, lots of different insurance companies. So it's a very, very fragmented market. And in terms of affecting change, it's very, very difficult to affect change. With the position that we have in the market here in Hawaii, mm -hmm. we have the opportunity when we go to a hospital, when we go to a physician group, when we go to an employer and talk about what we want to do, why we want to do it, how we want to improve the health and well-being, it's a much easier sell for the hospitals and the docs to respond to what we're doing because they, you know, part of our job is to convince them of the value of what we're doing. And because we are a material share of their market, mm -hmm. whether it's a hospital, whether it's a physician, whether it's a physician group, mm -hmm. there's an incentive for them, as long as they, you know, believe in what we're doing, to come along with us on this journey and of transformation. I, I've, I've said a couple, on a couple occasions when I've given other talks um, that I think the HMSA has a larger impact on the healthcare system than the Department of Health does. And I don't mean to be facetious about that, but uh, the Department of Health, which does many important things and, and very well, uh, has many employees in the state. Their budget, you know, is 500 or 600 million dollars maybe, whereas HMSA is really handling the um, health economy in a much larger way. And so when you make a move or a proposal, I think it has farther reaching uh, impacts in many cases. So I know that you were recently involved in structuring a new um, approach to health care, for instance, with in partnership with Hawaii Pacific Health. Maybe you could share a little bit about what um, the clinical side of that is and how that will make healthcare better for people, how you're working maybe with independent physician groups and some of the programs that you're rolling out. Because, um, like I said, the Department of Health has a very large responsibility for our public health. You're four or five times bigger than them in some ways. And so maybe your impact is greater. What do you think about that? Well, um, we do have a significant impact. But as I also said, we also take that responsibility very, very seriously. We are, um, you know, HMSA again has been here for 75 years and traditionally we've offered worked as an insurance company providing um, health benefits to a growing proportion of the population. And the focus has been, for example, on making sure that we pay claims quickly, we pay them accurately, that we follow, you know, sound medical policy, right. um, that we, you know, protect our members, we protect employers. However, we're now moving in some very, very different directions. Um, we are collaborating with providers across the state, whether it's individual hospitals, mm -hmm. whether it's the hospital systems you mentioned, right. whether it's individual physicians, whether it's physician groups, whether it's primary care docs, whether it's specialists. We now talk openly and consistently, consistently 
about the partnerships with these organizations. And the partnership we have with Hawaii Pacific Health is just one example. Just a, within the last two months, we signed a new five-year agreement with Hawaii Pacific Health starting in January of 2014 that runs all the way through 2018. Mm -hmm. Now that agreement covers, it's a five-year agreement, it covers all of their four hospitals and their approximately 350 employed physicians. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very important partnership, Josh, because it shifts the focus away from traditionally what we have done, which is processing claims, and it focuses on improving the health and well-being of the population that Hawaii Pacific Health serves. This is the, yeah, this is what I'm very interested in. So, um, so a lot of people would say, boy, that sounds un you know untraditional for um, an insurance company, uh, even a nonprofit one, to get involved in improving outcomes and to make that their focus. So, when you say improving outcomes, what does that mean when you? when you do a contract with a hospital system um, and you decide you're going to focus on outcomes? Well, let me give you some examples. We have a hospital quality program um, that we work with with all the hospitals in the state. And in that hospital quality program, which has a material sum of dollars tied to that, mm -hmm. we work with the hospitals and we actually incent them or provide rewards, monetary rewards, right. for them to do certain things. Now, one of them, for example, is reducing readmissions. Um, this is a big focus that CMS has. CMS, which is the government agency, Centers for Medicare and Medicare Services, mm -hmm. federal government. It's a big focus that they have as well for their uh, senior members. Right. We apply that to our senior members and our commercial members and our Quest members. We want to reduce readmissions. People should not be in hospitals unless they really need to be there. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways you reduce readmissions is working on the transition from an inpatient setting to the outpatient setting, right. connecting the primary care docs in the community right. with the hospitals and sharing information, making sure, for example, that when patients are discharged that the primary care physician knows if their medications got changed, if there was some equipment that was ordered, did they get the equipment, mm -hmm. did they do a follow-up, are they following their pres are they following the instructions for their prescription, is the prescription working, right. um, are there any adverse side effects. So that's one example. So you're saying, um, so people understand that you're putting more money uh, toward the hospitals or the physicians to do a better job. So if they're able to provide more supportive care, for instance, uh, in the outpatient setting when people are at home, you're willing to pay more to get those good results so that people don't end up getting sicker and land back in the hospital. Is that what you're talking about? Yes, it is, but let me, let me back up just a little bit. Traditionally, the way HMSA and other insurers, including CMS, have worked with hospitals and, and um, physicians right. is that they have paid them on a fee-for-service basis. Right. Now, what that means is it's a per-transaction basis. And under that type of a model, hospitals and doctors get paid more when they do more and that's regardless of the outcome. Right. Now that, you know, it's worked for a long time. Well, it's a system that has been in place. You can debate whether or not it worked. Right. But we're shifting away from that because we're saying, and many other people are saying as well, that focusing just on volume doesn't produce the type of outcomes that we as a community should be getting. So what we're doing now is saying to hospitals and saying to docs, instead of just focusing on volume and increasing volumes, mm -hmm. let's take care of a population that we serve. Let's reduce the rate the incidence of diabetes, right. people with hypertension. Let's reduce the incidence of hypertension or manage people who have hyper hypertension. Right. Let's make sure that all the kids get immunized. Let's make sure that all our seniors get their flu shots on an annual basis. Let's make sure, for example, with hospitals that you reduce, you know, hospital acquired infections. So that's the type of things that we're talking about when we focusing now on putting resources and dollars into outcomes, not just into volume, which is how we have been working as an industry for the last many decades. So that, that's the title, I guess. That's the revolutionary piece, right? Is that the old system, which just was fee-for-service, docs would just bill, 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 depending on how many people they saw, irrespective of whether they got better. We always hope they got better because we have good doctors in our state. But the revolution is the system is going to be totally different. It's going to reward hospitals and doctors for good outcomes. And some of the money, instead of being paid just because I saw you as a physician in the office or I saw you in the emergency department, the whole societal health is going to be looked at. So those are you saying those who take a larger responsibility for society's health will tend to be rewarded in the new system? Absolutely. 
we believe that we've not thrown out the fee-for-service model. Mm -hmm. We still pay on a fee-for-service basis that in addition to these fee-for-service or transactional payments, there is material sums of money, and that sum of money is getting bigger year by year, mm -hmm. that is tied to outcomes for quality, safety, and efficiency in improving population health. And that's okay. a very, very different model from how healthcare has been constructed in Hawaii and many other parts of the country. It, it is very different, and I think um, before before we head into our first break, I think it's important to reflect on where we were and where we are today, which is just in a few years, a few short years since you've come aboard, we've seen these really significant changes in our healthcare system, many of which have been led by HMSA, and I have to say, for one, I appreciate that. Uh, it doesn't, I wouldn't say it's not without growing pains, we all, you know, experience these, these big transitions differently, but it's very interesting for me to hear from my own physician community how different uh, healthcare and healthcare payments are becoming. And I think probably it's, um, at least from a philosophical perspective, a good thing for people to be aware, whether it's HMSA or the physician community or the hospital community, to be focused more on the wellness of our whole society rather than worried one by one by one whether or not um, that encounter is what we bill for. So I think it's a, it's a big change for the better, uh, but maybe we'll unpack it further after our break and we'll talk, talk about the patient centered medical home and that initiative that you've been leading in the last couple of years. Thank you. Be happy to. Okay. So we'll take our first break and then we'll be back with Hilton Rathel from HMSA. Aloha. I'm Nicole Horry for ThinkTech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaii Foreign Trade Zone No. 9 has brought the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. DBET, the Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism, operates Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone program to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone's mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii, thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Nicole Hori. Mahalo. Hello. Aloha, this is Jay Fidel. You know, uh, Think Tech and the Hawaii Venture Capital Association put on monthly luncheon panel programs at the Plaza Club here in Pioneer Plaza. Our program this time is on September 26th. It's called Solar in Hawaii. We're going to examine the solar industry and see what's in it for the long haul. Uh, we have a great panel, great moderator. Uh, we'll be sending out email on this. If you want to be in our email list to receive the details, uh, check out thinktechhawaii.com. In any event, you can sign up for the program at hvca.org. Thanks. See you there. This is Jay Fidel. Mahalo. Welcome back to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host, Josh Green, uh, Senator and Emergency Room Physician. Uh, today I'm uh, honored to have Hilton Rathel, who is Executive Vice President of HMSA, sharing with me the uh, part that HMSA is playing in the healthcare revolution as we put it today for today's program. Uh, before the break, we had talked uh, briefly about how things are so different in healthcare and how healthcare and the system uh, interacts with the insurance industry. What I'd like to do now is I'd like to begin talking about one of the major initiatives that's come from uh, the leadership of HMSA, and that's the patient-centered medical home. So Hilton, uh, a few years ago, we first started hearing about the possible implementation of a new healthcare system for our primary care docs called the patient-centered medical home. Uh, but the term had been around for quite a long time. Could you maybe give us a little bit of history and then talk about why HMSA has embraced this model? Certainly. Um Patient-centered medical home is not a new concept, as you mentioned. It's been around for a few decades, actually, but it's only really in the last, approximately uh, last decade, that it's really taken off. Mm -hmm. Now, patient-centered medical home, or PCMH, as we call it, right. it's not something that HMSA invented. Um, some of the one of the original founders actually was a pediatrician here in Hawaii, Dr. Calvin Sia. Right. Um, and he, he, he still, still lives here in Hawaii, and his son is a pediatrician in Hawaii as well. Mm -hmm. um, but patient and medical home has taken off in many parts of the country and has been a very, very successful model. One of the things, Josh, that we did when we, at HMSA, when we were looking at what did we need to do to better address the needs of our population, mm -hmm. we looked at the issue of primary care. Now, primary care, we believe, has been undervalued um, in Hawaii and in the United States in the last many decades. I'm glad to hear that because I'm trained as a primary care physician initially. <laughs> well, we recognize that. And so one of the things that we've done and one of the very conscious decisions we've made 
is that we needed to invest very heavily in primary care. Now that doesn't mean that we're taking money away from specialists, that's not what we've done. We need the gastroenterologists, we need the surgeons, we need the orthopedic surgeons, we need the nephrologists, we need those. But we do, what we do need is more primary care physicians. Mm -hmm. People, uh, there's a lot of stories you know, lo here locally and nationally about the shortage, the impending shortage of physicians. Right. Um, and one of those primary shortage areas is potentially um, primary care. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways that you make primary care more attractive is to actually in increase the amount of reimbursement that primary care physicians can earn. Because when a physician, uh, when, you know, when a resident medical student you know, chooses a residency or chooses a program to go into, one of the things obviously they look at is what is their earning potential. And the way that healthcare has evolved in the United States over the last few decades, specialists in general earn two to three times more than what a primary care physician can earn. And so when a primary care, when a physician goes to a residency, they look at their options and they look at that earning potential over a lifetime, they look at their, they look at what it's going to cost to pay back their educational loans, medical school loans, buy a house, send the kids to college. That has a huge impact. So we have decided that we needed to put more money into primary care and the patient set of home, patient, um, the patient set of medical home right. is one model of doing that. Now, what that model does is it focuses on the relationship between a primary care physician mm -hmm. and the member. It has, it's a team concept where you have a team mm -hmm. working with the, the, the team in a physician's office, working together with a physician. Some people use the phrase, the physician being the captain of the ship. Right. So they are the captain, but there are other people, whether it's um, nurses, whether it's medical assistants, whether it's uh, the office staff, whatever it is that they do, mm -hmm. they all work in concert with the primary care physician to take care of a population of people. And so let's say it's, again, it's a very, it's a concept that has taken off nationally. Mm -hmm. It's taken off here in Hawaii. Right now we have about approximately 70% of our members are covered by physicians who are actively working on the patient set of medical home model. And we're very excited about that model. So, um so let me bring it back a step. So I can see how the focus to do patient center medical home was a very conscious one to put more emphasis on primary care and to encourage some of the young doctors to go into primary care. But you just said also that 70% of the patients are in a uh, patient centered medical home or a PCMH. Is it um, is this a new way for them to get care? Tell us how maybe that would benefit the patients. Like if if one's doctor isn't a PCMH. Um, versus another uh, patient who has a physician that's not. What's the benefit for the patient to have a doc that's doing PCMH? Well, we believe there's benefit both to the physician and to the patient as well. Okay. Because it's a system of care, it's a more coordinated treatment for the patient. For example, one of the things that physicians who are in a patient set up medical home, mm -hmm. one of the things that they agree to do as part of getting these payments, and there are some payments that are going with being part of this model, right. it's a, what we call an opt-in model. So we don't impose it on physicians. Primary care physicians get to choose whether or not they want to participate. Right. One of the things that they choose to do when they participate in this model, for example, is use tools or systems to help them manage a patient population. Let me give you a specific example. Mm -hmm. We have developed a tool or a registry, it's called Kaziva, it's developed by a company called Applied Research Works. And we have co-developed this product with Applied Research Works. It's a tool that's out there that um, over 700 doctors in Hawaii are currently using right now. And it's a registry, for example, that identifies for each physician, every single, for example, child who needs immunization, every child who's due for a well child visit, every adult who's due for a flu shot, every person who's been diagnosed with diabetes, whether or not they've had their annual foot exam, their eye exam, their hemoglobin A1C tested, have they had their blood pressure tested, all of that information is available in a easy point and click application so that the physician and their staff can track what's going on. And this again is one of the tools that helps that physician and their staff 
take care of a population of patients, mm -hmm. as opposed to, as you said earlier, being focused on just that patient that's in front of them for that eight or 10 minutes or 15 minutes you get for a doctor's visit. And if I'm not mistaken, I think that part of the initiative that you've chosen, uh, part of the reason that you've chosen, chosen patient-centered medical home is because over the years, the healthcare system has gotten so complex. A, a, a primary care physician, a, a doc with a shingle hung up on their door, um, who has to take care of all of the different tests, there's MRIs and CAT scans and so many new laboratory tests and so many more complex chronic diseases to manage, it's almost uh, become impossible to just do it all on your own. And so by implementing a system like the patient-centered medical home, reinforced by a tool like Coziva, you're making it easier for them to uh, look at the entire community that they're taking care of and say, okay, we have 60 or 70 people that have very tough to treat diabetes they can quickly bring it up on their tool with their with their system or with their staff and they can have group meetings or they can decide we're going to invest some resources in um, our community of patients uh, whereas if you didn't have a tool like Coziva or some of the other programs that you're developing it might be impossible to keep up with uh, kind of the modern healthcare system is that what we're saying well it's really interesting when you look at how physicians um, work and the different systems they have. You know, some physicians, before we had this tool that we called Gazeta, some physicians, for example, had index cards, just like you have in the library. Right. And they maintain these systems. But, and that may work for an individual physician, but for example, if you want to extract data out of that, or if you want to put together, for example, a panel of physicians, right. you've got to do all of that manually. So. Some physicians, it's really interesting, even with their paper systems, they were very, very effective physicians, but it took a lot of time to do that, mm -hmm. and it's each individual physician working on their own, and each individual physician essentially reinventing the wheel. Right. That doesn't make a lot of sense. It's not efficient for a community. So by having a tool, and Kazeva is just one tool that's out there, right. but by having tools like that, by using electronic medical records, registries, for example, these are systems that help support what a physician does, provides them prompts, alerts. It doesn't make decisions for them, but it helps guide them, it helps pr um, provide information so that they can make better decisions, better clinical decisions. So um, let me take it back uh, kind of to the 30,000 foot level again. So we established in our first, the first part of our segment today that HMSA um, has uh, taking the responsibility of caring for many thousands of individuals, like over 700,000, which is about 60% of the state. So is the reason to do these kind of programs to, you know, to evolve the healthcare system and to have these tools with physicians so that you can help globally, so that you can take a look at the treatment of diabetes across the state, since you're caring for well over half the people, you know, as part of your membership. Is that how well, you're approaching it? Well, that is true. When we look at information, and we're looking at information much more closely now than what we've ever looked at it before, we've got some really sophisticated systems in place. And when we look at how individual hospitals are doing, how individual physicians are doing, there's variability there. Some hospitals, some physicians do very well. Mm -hmm. Other hospitals, other physicians don't do as well. One of our goals, Josh, is to reduce the amount of variability. We want to make sure that the top performers stay up as top performance, but those who are struggling in certain areas, we want to, we want to help them, support them mm -hmm. to get their results better so that any person, whether they're in Hilo, whether they're in Maui, whether on, they're on Lanai, whether they're in Waianae, no ma whether they're in Honolulu, right. no matter where they are, we want to ensure that they all get the best possible care that they should be getting. And that's one of the goals of having systems, of ca systems and the tools is to reach out to them so it doesn't matter where they are. Mm -hmm. We can still get make sure that the physicians, the staff, the hospitals have the information they need to provide the best possible care. And does so with that approach in mind, um, has HMSA been deciding to you know invest more resources in some areas uh, related as opposed to others where people have been struggling? Because I I have heard tell that you've done some work with grants and supporting communities. For instance, the East Hawaii community has really uh, seemed to do have done great recently out of Hilo as they've been a part of the trans uh, transformation process in healthcare. So are you targeting resources to make healthcare better in Hawaii or is it kind of a, a one-size-fits-all approach? What's the general feeling been? Well, 
As I mentioned, we do want to make sure that every single one of our members, no, no matter where they are in the state, get the best possible care. That being said, there are regional differences. Sure. Some areas are much more challenging than others for a variety of reasons. Right. So, do we, um, we, now we do want to be, you know, that being said, we do want to be fair to hospitals, we want to be fair to doctors, right. but are there greater needs in certain areas and do we recognize those needs? Absolutely. We're working, for example, with the federally qualified health centers or the community health centers across the state, mm -hmm. and we're working them to identify what, and there's a term they use called social determinants of health. Right. And that looks at poverty rates, it looks at rates of crime, it looks at other types of social determinants that have an impact on healthcare. And some of those populations are very, very challenging to deal with. So our challenge there, Josh, is to figure out how do we work with those communities, whether it's in East Hawaii, whether it's in Waianae, whether it's in Waimanalu, mm -hmm. how do we work with those communities? How do we meet those unique needs? Does it, in some cases, mean it's adjusting our model? Yeah, we'll adjust the model. Do we need to make accommodations in certain areas? Yes, we do. But that's, we have the flexibility to be able to do that and to tailor these programs to that specific community. Now, at the end of the day, mm -hmm. diabetics, if there's, it's a diabetic in, in Waimanalu or a diabetic in Honolulu, we want to make sure that that diabetic gets the best evidence-based care. Right. And so that's our goal, make sure they get it, but then tailor the solution or the intervention to the population that we're dealing with. Right, and I, and I don't think anyone um, would fault HMSA or other companies for uh, addressing different regions differently. I mean, for goodness sakes, when I was working in Kau and then in the community health center, I was it. I was the only provider and I needed more support. So investing in a patient-centered medical home in that region would have been a godsend uh, because having more resources for uh, nurse practitioners or physician assistants to support my practice there would have made a big difference because I would have had more time. As it was, because I was the only person providing care there, I had very, very little time for each patient. My schedule was filled every day, so I really do commend HMSA for taking on this challenge because it is a challenge in our state. Some areas have far fewer healthcare providers, particularly in my area, the Big Island, we know that our shortages are great. And I know it's very challenging for the docs in West Hawaii and Hilo and Kau, even Waimea, to find the time uh, in the day to see all the patients that need care. So these systems are welcome. I think that it's nice to hear that you're able to model them, uh, but still at the same time keep in mind that best practices are our goal. Because I think as we all imagine, our auntie or our tutu or our kids, we want perfect care for them. We want immunizations just like they would get whether they're in New York City or California or Honolulu even if they're living in the countryside in Hana or Kau. Same thing goes for cardiac care. If they're having a heart attack, we still want them to get the top standard of care, but maybe it takes a little bit more investment. And I think that's what I'm hearing, um, we're seeing from HMSA. That is correct. I mean, let me give you one other example. When you look at a physician and a physician coming to Hawaii, now just coming to Hawaii, especially if you're not from here, right. that's a real challenge. That means you know your family's you know at closest is five five hours away on the west coast, yeah. um, and it's ten hours away flying time if you're on the east coast, for example. So it's a real challenge just coming to Hawaii. But then you talk about going to Kauai, going to Maui, going to the Big Island, for example. That's you have less educational opportunities for kids. If the spouse wants to work or needs to work, there's less work opportunities. So we, we're, we at HMSA, we're fortunate that we're able to help provide, for example, some relocation expenses to help offset the cost of physicians moving to some of these physician shortage areas. In addition, we're working very closely with the John A. Burns School of Medicine. We're working with the dean over there, some of his faculty over there, and talking to them about what we can do to help solve this, you know, help meet the community need and help solve this physician shortage. And so we're in active discussions with them right now in terms of one of the things we're looking at, for example, is increasing the number of family practice residency slots. Mm. Now, if you look at the number of, if you look at the stats that they have for residents who go through their program, the family practice program, and who are from, and who are from Hawaii, mm -hmm. Something I think the number is over 70 or 80 percent of those those residents who go through and graduate actually stay in Hawaii. I think that number was 85 percent. 85. All right, that's yes. even better. Yes. So 
one of the things that we want to do, Josh, is we're working with the dean and his faculty to say, what can we do to improve, to increase the number of family practice residency slots? Because the people who go through the training here, as we just talked about, have a much higher success rate in terms of staying, mm -hmm. and we do need more primary care physicians. So that's just one other area that we're working on. And I think that the, um, the general approach has been, too, that there's a cultural sensitivity from people who spend a couple years here, get their training here, and are comfortable in the community. I, I can recall it was quite um, a culture shock for me to come from Pennsylvania and land and go straight to Ka'u and start working. And now, I loved it. There's no question about it. The people are the most extraordinary people on the planet. It, um, on the Big Island there in Ka'u, but it is a very big change and I think a lot of uh, physicians come and go, just like a lot of lawyers or people that are transplanted from the mainland, spend a few years here and then leave, and it's a challenge because we invest in those people and we get them to embrace our healthcare system and then if we lose them, I think we lose a lot of ground. So I think that's another very good thing that HMSA is doing. Um, I think we have a lot of challenges because I know the shortage is about 20, 22 percent for all the physician disciplines. So again, I, I think it's interesting to see HMSA embracing the actual delivery of health care, looking at health care system changes, hopefully um, for the betterment, not just of the system, but also for the providers and helping their pro uh, professional lives. So I think we're going to take another break here before we go into our final segment, and then maybe we'll take up some of the uh, larger questions of how the Affordable Care Act, the federal legislation, is affecting HMSA and what that will mean to the people who pay for insurance. Okay. Great, thank you, Alton. Aloha, this is Jay Fidel. You know, uh, Think Tech and the Hawaii Venture Capital Association put on monthly luncheon panel programs at the Plaza Club here in Pioneer Plaza. Our program this time is on September 26th. It's called Solar in Hawaii. We're going to examine the solar industry and see what's in it for the long haul. Uh, we have a great panel, great moderator. Uh, we'll be sending out email on this. If you want to be in our email list to receive the details, uh, check out thinktechhawaii.com. In any event, you can sign up for the program at hvca.org. Thanks. See you there. This is Jay Fidel. Mahalo. Welcome back to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host, Josh Green, in the Senate and ER physician uh, by training and practice. Uh, today we have uh, the distinct pleasure of interviewing Hilton Rathel, who is uh, Executive Vice President, HMSA, and their Chief, he Chief Health Officer. Uh, he's really a kind of a, a wealth of information about what's going on in the state from the perspective, especially of the health insurer that's largest here in our state. In our first two 20-minute uh, segments, we were able to discuss at length uh, the impact the HMSA is having on healthcare transformation in our state. And we described it in our, uh, in our subtitle as a revolution, and in many ways it is revolutionary. We're seeing an investment in patient-centered medical home, which we talked about extensively, and a focus on population health. Uh, but since we have this resource today, uh, having a top person from HMSA, really at the very top, I really want to ask a few questions about uh, the Affordable Care Act, how that federal piece of legislation is impacting HMSA, and how that translates to our patients here in the state and our small businesses. I thought maybe that would be good for our viewers. Would that be okay, Hilton? Certainly. Um, if you've got three hours, we'll, uh, we'll cover it in detail. We do. Oh, I have 15 minutes, I should say. So uh, tell us, um, we've heard a ton about Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act, some positive, some negative, but you're really delivering uh, health insurance here in the state on the ground. You're seeing what the real impact is. So tell us, what do you expect? Are rates going to go up for premiums for businesses? Are they going to go down? What are you expecting in the next couple of years? It all depends. Okay. Tell us, give us the whole scope. Okay. So this is um, this is revolutionary. What is happening with the Affordable Care Act? Um, it's a uh, it's a grand experiment because this is a new model. Um, it's obviously untested. Right. Um, we don't even. It's it's rolling out over a period of time. Some of the Affordable Care Act, some of the mandates have already gone into effect. For example. Um, Adult children, uh, dependent children, being able to stay on their parents' insurance until the age of 26. Uh, the elimin of li elimination of lifetime maxes in terms of um, um, benefits paid out. Those have already gone into effect. Um, but there are some big changes coming up effective January, January of uh, 1st of next year, which right. is the insurance exchanges, or what we call in Hawaii here, the connector. So this would seem to affect you more than those other, those, those first pieces that you describe are kind of like the do-gooder pieces for sure, right? That nobody could be refused care because there's no lifetime max. We could insure our, um, 
our children up well past the time they were in college. No one got refused care insurance. Um, Pre existing I conditions. I don't think that was your MO before, but it's certainly not now either. Um, but now, this insurance exchange is coming on, and next week we're going to actually have Coral Andrews, to, who's who's the executive director of the Health Insurance Exchange, to talk to us about the specifics. But from your perspective, what's that going to do? What does that mean to people who have HMSA insurance? Well, one of the biggest changes for us, Josh, is that we're now moving from a business-to-business -business model to a business-to-consumer model. Okay. So historically, um, because of the, especially because of the Prepaid Health Care Act in Hawaii, which actually has provided a huge amount of benefit to the uh, residents of Hawaii mm -hmm. that was enacted in 1974. Because of prepaid, any um, employer with more than one employee is required to, um, with, with one or more employees, is, is required to pay, uh, uh, pay for insurance for mm -hmm. those employees. So that's been a huge benefit. and. As a result, we have a very low uninsured rate in the state of Hawaii compared to most other states. We have one of the lowest rates, somewhere in the neighborhood of 8 to 10 percent, depending on how you count the numbers. Right. Now, with the Affordable Care Act, how that will influence that group, and we'll talk about some of the other groups that will impact, but how it will affect the uninsured rate the, is that some of those individuals, potentially half of those individuals, which is maybe in Hawaii, maybe 50,000 or 60,000 people, mm -hmm. They'll be eligible for um, tax credits, uh, or ta sorry, subsidies on right. the exchange. So there are now. What that means is that um, insurance companies like HMSA right. can sell insurance on the exchange or through the connector, mm -hmm. and then these individuals can go to the exchange or to the connector. They can look at it. They can put in some information, and they can find out if they qualify for some type of a subsidy to purchase insurance. So there is a, it's an opportunity for people to go on and to compare plans in an online marketplace right. and then purchase insurance. And they'll, so basically, I'm an uninsured individual uh, in this example. I go to the portal, I think is what they're calling it, for um, the health insurance exchange. It comes up on my computer or I go somewhere where there is a computer and I see HMSA and with Kaiser, right? Right now, HMSA and Kaiser are the only two plans who have chosen to be on the exchange okay. in so, Hawaii. So then I put my name in and I want insurance. I know I have to get insurance or I'm going to pay a tax penalty. So I decide, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to get health insurance finally. I still don't make a lot of money. How do I afford it? Well, as I said, the, um, there are formulas um, and you enter in, for example, your age, some demographic information and you enter in your income or your projected income for 2014 because this takes effect in January 1 of next year right and then you will get back a response that tells says whether or not you qualify for a subsidy okay. so that you could get a subsidy for 30 40 or 50 percent of the cost of buying insurance right. now someone actually has to pay for that subsidy right. so that's coming through taxes and um, and there are also fees that get imposed um, on insurance companies across the country uh, that, that help, help offset the costs of running these exchanges and these subsidies and tax credits. So, okay, so if we set aside, you know, the larger political question about whether it's good to use tax dollars for um, subsidies of health insurance or not, but we assume that we all want to take care of our neighbors. These are people that live down the street from us. They are our family members. We're getting them health insurance. Um, does it make it uh, a better system is this for instance is this good for HMSA and the other providers that are going to be a participants in the health insurance exchange is this going to make it easier for you to provide insurance to your members across the state or is it going to be harder what do you think well Josh one of the earlier comments I made is that our mission or our goal is to improve the health and well-being of the people of Hawaii right again we take that very very seriously we th this state has demonstrated through the initiative with the prepaid health care act that having insurance or having as many people as, as possible insured in the state is a very, very good thing. We have very low rates um, or the, the premiums are very low compared to most other states in the country despite the high cost of living mm -hmm. in Hawaii. And one of the primary reasons for that is that we have a very high rate of insured population in the state. Mm -hmm. Now we also have, there are other reasons as well, but that's a whole nother topic. Right. So. The fact that you know providing insurance to more people certainly does help. There's a lot of evidence that that says that that leads to 
driving down the overall cost of insurance. When people have insurance, the more likely to seek care earlier for conditions before they develop into full-blown acute conditions right. where they show up in an emergency room, get admitted to a hospital. If you can intervene much earlier in the progression of a disease or in terms of some type of something that's going wrong, which insurance allows you to do, right. we would see that as a good thing. Yeah, I, I think um, it gives people peace of mind for sure. I can tell you uh, when I see people in the emergency department, I, I do see a pretty high of, of the small percentage in our state of those who are uninsured, I see a disproportionate number of those who are uninsured because they didn't have another doctor to go to and now they have a terrible laceration or they're quite sick and they don't have somewhere else to go and they land in the ER. And it's, it's always kind of um, heart-wrenching to see individuals as patients when I know I'm going to take care of them 100%, but I can see the struggle that they have about whether or not they can now afford their bills in the ER, whether or not they can afford the medications that we may prescribe or the procedures that I have to do in the ER as their doc. And that, I really, I do think it is, it's gut-wrenching. So I'm very pleased to see us moving to a place where everyone gets insurance. Um, but I, I suppose another positive benefit is what you say, which is that if everyone gets involved, the costs could overall come down. Now, what is your expectation? Because I hear everything across um, the spectrum. I hear people say the sky is going to fall when we implement uh, the Affordable Care Act. The sky clearly hasn't fallen. But once people actually all have to go in and buy insurance, um, do you think that the rates will flatten out or will they actually come down for some people that pay for insurance? What do you expect the next five years to look like? Well, that's a really good question and there's a lot of differing opinions. but. Um, you did ask earlier whether rates are going to go up or rates are going to go down, and I said it depends. Well, the reality is it does depend. Now, um, the way insurance has traditionally worked, or group insurance, is that you put a pool of patients together. Let's say you're an employer with 20, 30, 50, 50 employees and their dependents. Right. They form a pool, and they are rated based on the experience, or the insurance is set based on how many healthcare resources they consume in a given year. Right. Now under the Affordable Care Act, the what we call that experience rating or that community rating, that goes away. And so under the Affordable Care Act, you only rate based on age and tobacco use. Now it does, so what that means is that um, previous experience does not factor into this so that if you have, for example, a younger, sicker population or they've had a lot of accidents, for example, that doesn't go into the rating at all. The only thing that goes into their rating under the Affordable Care Act is their age. So there is definitely going to be an impact. Now, some individuals, some groups are going to see, or some individuals are going to see their rates go up. Other individuals are going to see their rates go down. Now, regardless of whether they go up or down, mm -hmm. they may qualify, a business may qualify for a tax credit, right. and an individual may qualify for a tax subsidy or a subsidy for a subsidy on their on their premiums. So it really does depend on whether you're an individual, whether you're part of a group, it depends on your age. Um, but the shift which happens in two, starting in 2014 for individuals and small groups, because they are the only people impacted in 2014. Right. The Affordable Care Act doesn't apply to larger groups until until the latter years. Right. But for 2014, whether you're an individual, whether you're a group, um, there, it, it, does, it does depend. Some will go up, some will go down. Um, as, I also, as I said previously, we have relatively low insurance rates in the country. Right. So um, some people will see a decrease, but, some, peop but um, it, it's, some people will be happy and some people won't be happy with their results. I think that that, and we're, we're coming to the end of our program, I think that that is an interesting takeaway, that we really are still a part of this experiment. Um, the good news, however, is that already most of our Hawaii citizens are covered. And so many will not see a significant impact. Many will not have to go to the exchange. They already have their insurance all sewn up. Um, I do think it's going to have a very positive impact on those individuals that just haven't had any coverage whatsoever, because they could go bankrupt, frankly. Um, that can completely wipe families' uh, resources out in an instant. Just one car accident or one severe pneumonia which lands a loving family member in the hospital or one child that, God forbid, gets meningitis and has to be in the hospital for several weeks. No one really that I know can afford uh, a hospitalization like that if they weren't insured. So on the whole, I'm really looking forward to this change. 
Uh, but before we go, I just wanted to thank you for coming today. I think that healthcare, uh, we call the show Healthcare in Hawaii, it's such a complex topic that having your perspective makes a big difference to be able to hear what's a large company that's engaged with over 700,000 of us. I mean, it's really no other, I don't know of any other business that engages with that many of our citizens at once, um, is taking on the challenge of helping to transform this healthcare system into a better place. So if I may, we certainly are gonna invite you back in the future to see how this grand experiment of the Affordable Care Act is working out, and also to see what the impact of healthcare transformation from HMSA's perspective in partnership with the providers uh, looks like a year from now. Does that sound like a deal? It does, and Josh, Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Okay. Thank you very much, Hilton. I do appreciate it. Okay. So that's the end of our show today with um, Hilton Rathel, who is uh, Executive Vice President at HMSA, and me, your moderator, Josh Green, the Hawaii Senate and ER physician. Next week, I'm honored to have Coral Andrews, who is uh, another uh, person of interest here in the healthcare uh, change, as we like to say, or healthcare transformation in the state of Hawaii. She's running that health insurance exchange, and she's going to give us the details about that program and how it will help you, the consumer of healthcare here in Hawaii. Thanks again.